Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, it is a pleasure to be here and to hear uh, our wonderful presenters present on Soundscapes today. So I will introduce our first speaker, uh, Ning Li. Ning Li is a master's student in the Graduate Institute of Foreign Languages and Literatures from National Taiwan University. Her research interests include 20th and 21st century English literature, Victorian literature, effect studies, media theory, post-human studies, and visual culture studies. In today's presentation, Ning explores how the urban body in Anna Burns' Milkman depicts the unique soundscape of Belfast during the Troubles and how the novel is haunted with digital noises of control. So Ning, whenever you are ready. Okay, um, let me share my screen for you. Okay, um, so I'll just start. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, Anna Burns' 2018 novel, Milkman. So um, I'll just read my um, presentation that I prepare. Um, on October 16, 2018, the Committee of Man Booker Prize awards its final prize to Anna Burns for her novel, Milkman. As the first Northern Irish writer ever wins the award, Burns, however, does not entirely dedicate her winning novel to her native country. In an interview conducted um, after the announcement of the Booker Prize, Burns proclaims that I am writing about a repressive, closed, insular society, whether it's Northern Ireland or not. That is the sort of society I'm writing about. For this intention, Milkman turns out to be wildly recognized for less its Northern Irish specificity than its universality. Set in Belfast, um, 1979, Milkman tells the story of a nameless 18-year-old girl called Middle Sister, growing up in a troubled area of everyday violence, insidious surveillance, sectarian division, and endless stalking. Despite taking place almost half a century ago, the narrative is indeed found uncannily familiar with recent global issues such as Me Too movement, Brexit, terrorism, digital surveillance, and so on. What can be perceived is the tendency of placing milkman beyond and even away from the Irish context. Such a tendency of reading Milkman beyond the Irish context turns out to be a problematic feature in post-agreement Irish literary studies. Emerging after the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, post-agreement literature often denotes a body of texts written by writers growing up during the Troubles and being published in the aftermath of the agreement. Distinguished from the pre-Troubles and Troubles literature, it reflects while also engaging with the new peace-oriented political atmosphere promised by the agreement, shifting away from the repressive past to the progressive future. It is often situated within the dominant political discourse of moving on and looking forward. As suggested by Seamus Heaney, post-agreement literature, quoted, takes place at the level of creative spirit in a realm of glimpsed potential rather than intransigent solidarity, end quote. Yet critical attention has also given to the rhetorical dismemberment of the violent past, post agreement literature uh, often features. This rhetorical dismemberment speaks to the continuous critical reluctance to engage with the troubled past where historical and cultural specificity in post-agreement texts is often steered away for much more universal discussion. It is then no surprise when Milkman as a post-agreement novel is wildly approached in the absence of its historical significance, even intended by the author herself. Um, this paper contends that Anna Burns' Milkman, in fact, served as a critical post-agreement text. Instead of perpetuating, it interrogates the overwhelmed post-agreement voices of peace and progress by compelling recognition to the Belfast urban soundscape during the Troubles. To do so, Burns focuses on not the sounds of gunshot and bombing that often characterize the violent history of the Troubles, 
but the more insidious and terrifying sounds of control and surveillance, particularly the unexpected clicking sound of the camera, which I would like, like to elaborate later. Haunted by the soundscape, the middle sister in Milkman becomes what Gillis Dillis termed the vigil in a society of control, where her body is often modulated into digital sounds always ready to be captured, intercept, and overheard. Whereas her acts of dismissing the urban noises as jamais vu only constitutes herself being systemized in control. Hiding experiences of numbers epitomized in middle sisters deviant reading while walking, I argue that Burns further explores the active potential of bodily irresponsiveness that not only escapes control, but also challenge the impasse of post-agreement climate. In Postscript on the Society of Control, Deleuze described this as a control society as a new historical regime since the 20th century that is distinct from the disciplinary society of the 18th and 19th century, Foucault has pronounced. While a disciplinary society works through establishing rigid and closed spaces, control society, on the other hand, functions through a mechanism of modulation continuously changing from one point to the other, for which the temporal logic of control, unlike the long, infinite, and discontinuous discipline, is not only short term and of rapid rates of turnover, quoted, but also continuous and without limit. As the Lutz puts in, quote, the societies of control, one is never finished with anything. The cooperation, the educational system, the armed services, being meta stable states coexisting in one and the same modulation like universal system of deformation. Illustrating Franz Kafka's The Child, the list continues to suggest that the apparent acquittal of the disciplinary societies becomes the limitless postponements of the societies of control. Moreover, individuals, once enclosed in the space of disciplinary societies, become individuals that is inseparable from masses, samples, data, markets, or banks. While the period of the trouble is often associated with Northern Irish history of post-colonial violence and discipline, Burns in Milkman depicts the nascent emergence of society of control with the rise of digital technology and cybernetic logic that also comes to characterize the troubles. Often referred to the sectarian and paramilitary violence from 1969 to um, 1998, the Troubles has become the indelible mark of atrocity in Northern Irish history, causing more than 3,600 deaths. Roots of the Troubles can be traced back to the end of First World War, where Northern Ireland was a treat created with a number of uneasy ethnic and religious compromises. The Second World War further enlarges the ethnic religious problem due to the partition of the Irish con continent. Peter Mahon has described the trouble as the quoted 30 year cycle of tribe clashes and how it has long been perceived as a result of the incapacity for different Irish ethnic nationalities to coexist in the same small space. It is built upon the antagonistic division between Irish Catholic nationalists on one hand and British Protestant unionists on the other. This antagonistic division becomes the systemic logic of control of living in the troubles, a persistent logic of antagonism always between two rival ethnic communities, two competing ideas about identity and belonging, and two antagonistic visions of political aspiration. Middle sister and milkman has described how such a naturalized order takes place in her time, Everything can only be understood through essential division, whether their side or our side, your religion or our religion, defenders of the state or renouncer of the state. In other words, everything needs to be political, categorizable, dividable in order to be made sense and comprehensible, or else it would be out of ordinary. The control logic of endless antagonism is further carried out in the urban soundscape through digital media. Burns that Burns depict in the novel, most apparently in everyday clicking sound of the camera. Middle sister described how her daily running routine is always infiltrated by the unexpected clicks of camera and how her body is further being modulated into data to be collected, 
into data to be collected. The hidden camera clicked just one click, a state force click, in a similar way to how that bush positioned along the same reservoir had done a week earlier. Already within a week of that first click, I've been clicked again four times. Once had been in town, once when walking into town, and twice coming out of town. I've been photographed from a car, from a seemingly disused building, also from other bits of greenery, perhaps due there have been other clicks I hadn't picked up on at the time. On each occasion when I did hear them, the camera would snap as I passed. And so yes, it seemed I'd fallen into some breed, maybe the central grid as part of the disease, the rebel infection. The word grid is inviting here as it invokes the cybernetic logic of urban planning that cultivates a society of control in an an unescapable grid is the insidious state surveillance, the spying, the infiltrating, the monitoring, the in intercepting, where, quote, everybody has a file one on them. Everybody's house, everybody's movements, everybody's connections constantly are checked and keep an eye on. Here, the individual becomes individual, ready to be comprehensible, categorized, and, decif and decipher, decipher. The individual under the, sorry, the individual under the acoustic control in Milkman further developed a body technique of on-off distinction, mirroring the logic of antagonism while only reaffirming the body being integrated within the sound control order. Describing the bodily mechanism of electric lights as a way of living in the troubles, middle sister implies the, this on-off body technique. It was as if the electric lights were turned off always turn off, even though dusk was over, so they should have been turned on, yet nobody was turning them on and nobody noticed either. They weren't on. All this to seem normality, which meant then that part of normality here was this constant unacknowledged struggle to see. People have trained to turn off their physical senses and bodily awareness in order to survive in the antagonistic permeated political environment Returning off as the normality of a way of living and fitting in the turbulent era. Moreover, turning off has become a kind of jamais vu, the opposite of deja vu, which delineates the experience of memory lapses characterized by being unfamiliar of something that is actually familiar. This experience of jamais vu is demonstrated in the collective ignorance of the camera click, which often disturbs middle sister, who is highly aware of the click itself as middle sister's brother-in-law confronts her. I always ignore clicks, he said. What do you expect me to do? Get outraged, write letters, keep a diary, put in a compli complaint, get one of my personal secretaries, secretaries to contact the United Nations. Um, tell me, sister, what do I contact and what do I say? And while you are about it, what are you going to do about the click yourself? The, delib lib delib lib the deliberate turning off entailed by the experience of Jean Vu, despite the intention to escape the control society, only illustrate how we formulate the on-off cybernetic loop involved by the camera clicking sound, in which they are already within the control itself as they become endless, cyclical, aimless, and recursive work. Middle sisters reading while walking, which is a very distinct feature in the whole novel itself, however, provides an alternative that escapes the urban soundscape of control. Through the deviant activity of reading while walking, experience of jambi vu is transformed into experiences of what middle sister herself identified as numbers. The numbers evoked by reading while walking does not entail passive response, but active non-response, where the body no longer becomes inaccessible to the urban soundscape. In the beginning of the novel, middle sister confessed how she likes walking. Instead of taking the bus or accepting lifts, middle sister walks home from home work from work every day. On the one hand, she follows a specific route device by herself where she has to pass seven landmarks beginning with the 10 minute area, then the cemetery, the bread house, the holy woman's house, the parks and reservoirs, and finally her home. On the other hand, she knows the exact duration of walking from one place to another takes and how long would her entire walk spend. 
the entire narrative of Milkman could be said to be built upon Middle Sister's walking routine, where her specific ways of walking speak to how she perceives, interacts, and lives with the surrounding environment. Significantly, Middle Sister's way of walking involves not just walking, but reading, reading books and whole books, along with taking notes, checking footnotes, underlining passages. She is the girl who walks, more specifically walks while reading. Rather than a spontaneous act, reading while walking becomes a deliberate activity of numbers. Before being turned off, she turned herself off to the antagonistic environment. While to live in the troubles is then to be sensitive, be aware to divisions, to be in the know, to keep up with all the antagonistic division. Middle sisters remain insensitive, unaware, out of the know, not keeping with. Conducting reading while walking, middle sister switches off to her surrounding and displays only, quote, a vigilance not to be vigilant to those distinctions, including herself from any possibility of falling into the perpetual distinction making progress. As if disappearing into other dimension, middle sister's reading while walking now belongs to, quote, not by one side, not by the other side, not by anybody. Not only does she become disturbing, divian, creepy to the community, but she also receives any ready modulation where she could become accessible to the surveilling environment. For Burns, what is truly unsettling about the numbers, middle sisters reading while walking in books is a stake of uneasiness and unhingement that denaturalizes the urban soundscape and its underlying acoustic mechanism. The numbers not only delineates an emotional status, but more importantly, the bodily malfunctioning as a self-aware reaction to the system of control. I would like to conclude here with Middle Sister's epiphany in the end of the novel. Now growing to be able to enjoy her day one with her brother-in-law, Middle Sisters in the end expresses her awareness as well as her distance from the acoustic mechanism of control that haunts her in the past. It was that I was tired of the eye, tired of somebody, tired of rules and districts regulations. As for principles, sometimes you have to say stuff principles, such as now when the energy for me was over on all that. What takes over the end of the novel is no longer the noise of digital control, but instead everyday mundane urban sound. As Middle Sister highlights, quote, soon after and through their living room window came the sound of bags crinkling, of exclamation on purchases, of the urban business of drinks, glasses, ashtrays, and Elvis. For Burns, Milkman as critical post-agreement text is that it does not reinstate the post-agreement voices of peace and progress, and shifting attention from the digital control soundscape to everyday urban soundscape. We instead need to stir up the feelings of insecurity, anxiety, and uneasiness instead of taking it for granted. Only through these feelings, the troubles can be demystified and further steps of renegotiation can take place. So yeah, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm trying to find the clapping <laughs> icon. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Ning. So we will move on to our next presenter, uh, Bella Felton, whom I will introduce. Um, Bella Felton is a fourth year PhD student at Bowling Green State University in the Department of Theater and Film. Her research centers on digital performances in podcasting and other emerging online mediums. Pella has previously presented at the PMLA in 2018 and 2019 in the Theater and Violence and Clowning the Academy panels, respectively. She is also co-chairing the Cities of Sound, Podcasting as Public Texts, Media, and Performances panel, which is available now for download in podcast form. In today's presentation, uh, Pella concentrates Ezra Dickinson's work, a mixed reality performance that follows the dancer in downtown Seattle on a soundscape created by Paul Walsh. So if you want to share your screen anytime you're ready. Um, it says it won't let me share. Oh, 
let me try again here. Screen sharing has failed to start. Let me try again. Um, there we, there we go. There we go. So wonderful. Okay. Yeah. So this is um, this is a, a sound studies um, sort of analysis of a dance performance. So this is going to be a, a little interesting. And by the way, I once we're done, I can put the link to the thing so that if anyone wants to watch this, um, I highly encourage you. This is it's a pretty special piece of um, performance. At a corner on Seattle's Stewart Street, a group of about 12 people stand across from an abandoned Greyhound station. They wear headphones given to them by an usher who will navigate them through many sites of performance they will occupy for the next hour. The headphones will connect them to the piece by giving them a soundtrack to the performance. I think we're performance seeing of, your presenter view. I'm sorry to interrupt. I think so you're seeing my you're seeing the wrong side. We're, yeah, I think we're seeing your notes as well. Okay. So I'm not sure How about that's... now? Perfect. A performance of Ezra Dickinson's Mother for You, I Made This is about to begin. In this May 2013 performance, Dickinson will combine dance, installation art, and video projection to create an impressionistic portrait of his mother who lives with paranoid schizophrenia. Over the course of two weeks, Dickinson performs this piece nightly as audiences follow him across several blocks of Seattle as he dances in alleyways, under awnings, and even in front of a federal building. Throughout this hour-long experience, the audience will listen to a sound work by composer Paul Walsh designed to evoke the memories and feelings, providing an impressionistic and often dissonant, dissonant analog to the live performance. As two of the groups stand with the headphones on, listening to the soundscape being beamed to them from an iPhone inside of an orange briefcase, a small unassuming man in a brimmed toboggan sweater and brown plaid pants sits across the street. And um, that description comes from um, Waters as Ezra Dickinson takes this to the street with an emotional tribute to his mother. As the cluster of spectators begins to watch this man, they begin to hear a low electronic pulsing through their headphones. They stare at this mysterious man across the street whose hands rest at his side. This is a performance of turbulence. I, I like, I use the word turbulence. I've previously used imbalance to refer to this piece as well. Dickinson mentions in the soundscape, um, his voice is said asking, what, what shall we do with my mother who lives with imbalance? But within that imbalance, there's also this turbulence. And I like turbulence and thinking about the sound as being turbulent because it allows for a disruption to something. The state or quality of being turbulent, violent commotion, agitation, or disturbance. Disorderly or tumultuous character or conduct, and with a plural, an instance of this. Of fluid flow, of natural condition, stormy and tempestuous state, or action, violence. Turbulence disorders space. But in order for a space to be disordered, there must be order. And so a performance of turbulence acknowledges the structures in place and modifies them. And it does this through the mobilization of bodies in public space, disrupting us a kinesthetic, a social kinesthetic, which had programmed people to move through space in a particular way. The elimination of the technology of the city soundscape through the creation of sonic bubbles through headphones and a schizophonic relationship through acousmatic sound. So I wanna start here by talking really quickly about the social kinesthetic part of this. Um, and this comes from the research of the dance scholar, the late Randy Martin. And he defines the social kinesthetic as the orientation, presumption, or predisposition that informs 
approaches to movement, the historically specific microphysics that generate and govern motional fields. Um, he goes on further to say, from within mobilization, everything is networked and from social kinesthetic and organizational rule is discernible. So if we think about the choreography of a dance that we might see in a theater, we can think about that in terms of dance as being choreographed, but the design of a city, the social constructs of a culture also choreograph movement. And so in order to disrupt that, a turbulence occurs when noisy bodies disrupt the social kinesthetic through their presence and performance. So now I want to talk about really quickly about the um, some of the noisy bodies that are sort of foregrounded through this performance. And that is the um, Seattle's homeless population. Um, as you can see, Seattle's homeless population, particularly in 2013, was incredibly high. It continues to be, for the last decade, one of the top three um, most populated by homeless bodies of any city metropolitan area in the country. And Seattle's response to that culturally has been varied. You've had a, a lot of people who have worked to create spaces to help homeless populations, but you've also had a lot of media outlets like Com Como, which in, 20, in 2019 did an hour long documentary on the TV station KOMO, highlighting the danger that homeless people allegedly um, created for the community. Um, and when we think about performances and we think about space, and this echoes back to some of the conversations that we had in the City at Night panel earlier, is that the division of public and private space and public and, and private behavior cannot exist for an unhoused population because they are living in a public space. What has, what has been separated from the world, things as private as um, urination and defecation or sleeping are laid bare and publicly displayed for the population. And that creates a lot of the nature of a problem body. And yet within that, there are a lot of things that are still making them invisible, even as they are placed within a public space. Um, and here's where we talk about the soundscape a little bit. In, in soundscape, in the soundscape, our sonic environment and the tuning of the world, groundbreaking sound theorist Armory Schaefer examined the notion of sound and soundscapes as a constructed unit of culture. Schaefer uses the term keynote to refer to the natural sounds of a landscape. According to Schaefer, these sounds are created by geography and climate. While Schaefer considers these sounds as experienced as natural, they are far from neutral. According to Schaefer, individuals are interpolated into communities through the use of landmark sounds or sound marks, which, which make it specially regarded to its community. So in urban areas such as Seattle, landmark sounds themselves are constructed and populated by sounds of their desired use. And the sounds become performative of that constructive. Um, in his work, The Urban Ambiance, Gene Feibold um, notes the idea of an urban ambiance as a way of exploring the relationship between sound um, and space in a certain period of time. Therefore, like Martin's notion of a social kinesthetic, we can imagine the flow of sound through the urban soundscape as having a social acoustic. In the case of downtown Seattle, the normal sound cues in the space Dickinson performs would normally be inscribed with kinesthetic force of industry. Cars and buses moving through busy streets dominate sounds of humans which travel along the street. And indeed, these sounds are integrated into Walsh's soundscape. And at the beginning, all you could hear are the sounds of the city. The flow of these sounds are shaped 
by large office buildings, luxury hotels, etc., which block natural sounds from surrounding areas from penetrating the space. These sounds aren't neutral. They perform ideological expectations of the values of a space. These sounds promote specific understandings of what the acceptable purpose of this public space is and how bodies are expected to move through it. In this way, the social acoustics of an urban soundscape can be seen as equally formative force in the creation of public space as Martin claims that the social kinesthetic is. So now let's talk about headphones. To, in a system where we experience meaning of sounds is so well regulated, erasure becomes a political act. When Dickinson and his audiences put headphones on at the outset of the performance, they disconnect themselves from this soundscape and its ideology. No longer can they hear the voice coming from the crosswalk telling them to walk, 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 walk. No longer can they hear music coming from a storefront beckoning them in. They are erasing from the spaces the sounds which have been installed into the spaces, which hail them towards specific uses or understanding of downtown Seattle. The technology of the city soundscapes no longer dictates their oral understanding of the reality. It is instead curated specifically to be part of a pervasive mixed reality performance. In regards to the role of sound, Michael Bull argues in his article, Privatizing Urban Space in the Mediated World of iPod Users, that personal digital audio devices such as iPods and smartphones function as a space building and space populating forces within urban spaces. In the same anthology that this article comes from, Public Space Media Space, Chris Berry states that the habituated practices and enactments with media to produce the multifaceted subject of public space exists, while Barry suggests that while our notion of public space is still tied to the unpredictability of embodied experience, the presence of media within those spaces is rewriting the rules, expectations, and uses of those very spaces. As mobile media devices such as cell phones and iPods blur the line between public and private, leisure and labor, digital and corporeal, Barry argues that experience of public space is becoming increasingly tied to subjective and quotidian performances, which are marked as separate from traditional coding of private or home spaces. This subjective experience creates home-like subjective realities within the traditional objective, quote unquote, public sphere. So what happens when a bunch of people are listening to the same sonic bubble at the same time within the same urban ambiance? Because remember, ambiance implies a set period of time, a theatrical window, if you will. So suddenly the sonic bubbles curated for the audience are curated for them. This is what sets Mother For You, I made this apart from a lot of different pieces of mixed reality performance or some of the more um, alternate reality games such as uh, Pokemon Go. Um, the shared experiences of listening to a shared soundscape simultaneously create a makeshift shared soundscape. Um, and one of the people that attended this event, Michael Upchurch, actually noted this in his review at the time, noting the kind of auditory hallucination cutting you off from the passersby around you, letting you hear something that they can't hear. So rather than being interpolated um, into the community, these sound listeners are disinterpolating the community around them, pushing that away and creating a sonic enclave, all of their own. And within that though, we have this important idea of acousmatic sound. Um, Acousmatic sound is the notion that once we created as a culture technology which could record sound, for the first time, we could separate a sound from its source. So acousmatic sound comes from the research of the sound scholar Pierre Schaefer, 
um, which is within the last decade been translated by Michael Sheon. Um, but it is, it is also in dialogue with what Schaefer has been talking about with the soundscape. Within the soundscape, Schaefer talks about the separation of sound and source as this idea of schizophonia, splitting of sounds from their original context. Now, when these things were being theorized in the 60s, we did not have the decades of relationship of acousmatic sound. We did not have people walking around with Bose headphones the way that we do now. And so as these things have become more prevalent, our culture has had more of a comfortability with being in a public space, having headphones on, being cut off from the community around you. And, but this splitting also performs a dramatur dramaturgical purpose within um, Dickinson's piece, as the schizoid relationship between performing object and sound takes on an almost dialogic performance um, aspect where it is evoking the, um, the mental um, divergence of Dickinson's mother and her battle with manic schizophrenia and the failure, failure of social services to provide for her. Um, going to Eve Green, who wrote about the piece for the Seattle Star, it's no coincidence that the soundtrack composed by Seattle composer Paul Walsh can only be heard within the audience's head. And it, what this, I think this piece best explains this, this segment. The third movement of the dance piece takes place in front of the King County Federal Building. The space is occupied by rows of trees and benches, which soon become a canvas in which a textual monologue becomes an object that is installed by Dickinson within that space. Um, he and his um, long term, he and his longtime dance mentor, Marie Whiting, um, install this. And as he moves through the square, he brushes against bollards, grasps a tree longingly, and leans his head against the trunk. One of the piece's most powerful images, this banner continues to unfurl from under his shirt, like an umbilical cord joining Dickinson to the tree. I don't want to close my eyes again. Leading from his abdomen, he methodically wraps the rhythm around the tree's trunk. As he rotates around the tree, words begin to reveal themselves on the ribbon, not yet legible. Dickinson stretches out the ribbon from the tree to reveal the text, who will make a home for my mother who lives with imbalance. As he is doing this, mirrored sound is playing through the headphones. So you're hearing these words, but these words are, that you are hearing, while thematically relevant to what you are seeing, are not a direct analog. Instead, we realize as Dickinson stretches the ribbon through the maze of trees, circling the plaza seven times, that the text is the soundtrack, which indicts a mental health infrastructure that was unable to help his mother, but it's backwards. Walsh's score becomes increasingly dissonant, reflecting the chaos of Dickinson's installation poem. Still performing an experience of schizophrenia, the soundscape suddenly synchronizes with the text on the ribbon. Dickinson ties an edge of the ribbon to the tree as the text, I love you, mother, reveals itself. Then the phrase, look at me, mother, unravels as the ribbon enmeshes more and more trees and light posts. As experiences of sound and kinesthesis come together, Dickinson pivots out of the back plaza back onto the sidewalk, holding on tightly to the edge of the ribbon, which reads, my mother has wet the bed. The words displayed on the banner mirror that of the soundtrack, except as I mentioned before, they are in reverse, forcing the audience to connect the text and sound more abstractly. Then as a cymbal crash disrupts the steady drone of Walsh's score, Dickinson let go, lets go, springing the ribbon forward as it falls to the ground. I've never, now I did not get to see this in person when, when Dickinson performed this in 2013. I, I witnessed this through an archival recording that Dickinson put on um, Vimeo. However, I find it quite remarkable 
that because of the nature of how Wallace's score was integrated, the way I experienced the soundscape was identical to the people that were there in presence in 2013. I was hearing to, to the extent that any two people could hear the same thing as all of our hearing capacities are different. But the soundscape of Seattle captured within that recording and soundscape remains static to the point that I am hearing what the audience in Dickinson heard that day when I listened to this piece. And this, and this makes it able for me to imagine what is happening and how everyone was feeling when they experienced this. What keeps drawing me back into this piece after two years of studying it is how Dickinson used his body to create presence through disruption and, and how he used disruption to create presence. His turbulent body, which was once referred to by a critic as quote unquote kinesthetic insanity, brings into focus a body who deviated from the script by challenging bodies to participate in a deviant occupation of space. In a culture that absolutely has been culturally telling the unhoused population of Seattle that they are problem bodies and do not belong in the space, there is a political immediacy to talking and placing yourself and challenging the purpose of public space. More than anything, this piece shows me the value of undoing order with the commotion of agitation or disturbance. In the case of this piece, the vibrations that we are receiving become both disruptive, but in their own way, very utopian. Um, the performance scholar Jill Tolan talks in great detail in her book, Performing Utopia, about the presence of utopian performatives, moments and physical actions in a performance which bring to the surface truths and presences otherwise not experienceable. And what I think is unique about this performance is it is able to translate those beyond the realm of co-presence so that I years later can be included within this community as we know there are still homeless in Seattle. So I think that it's worth thinking about these vibrations as existing long after the co-presence exists. Um, thank you very much. Um, sharing here once I figure out how to get the okay, how we go. thank you so much Bella um, that was wonderful so we will uh, continue with our final presenter uh, Alix Mazuet uh, so I will introduce Alix Alix Mazuet uh, relocated to California after having taught French and Francophone studies as associate professor in the Department of Modern Languages at University of Central Oklahoma. She now teaches French as a foreign language and Francophone cultures at Stanford University Language Center. Alix specializes in French cultural history of the long 19th century with two additional areas of expertise, sound studies and sub-Saharan post-colonial literatures and cultures. In her research, she focuses on the history of the book, libraries and reading practices, 19th century French soundscapes, and power dynamics in Francophone sub-Sahara. In today's presentation, Alix examines on the urban soundscape of the French Industrial Revolution with an emphasis on Baron Haussmann's transformation of Paris in the mid 19th century. So Alix, whenever you want to. Thank you, Dr. Kamsa. Let me uh, share my screen. Uh, there we go. And um, so let me start. There we go from the start. Uh, so uh, urban soundscape of the 19th century French industrial culture 
with the formidable transformations Baron Haussmann made to the French capital in the mid 19th century, including the installation of gas followed by electric lighting in the streets, Parisians could see better and to a greater distance than ever before. With the demolition and construction work these transformations necessitated, however, along with urban migration, the development of industrial plants, manufacturing and public transport, what had also been generated was an entire array of new sounds, human and mechanical, dense crowds, train stations, streetcars, factories, and so forth. In many ways, the city of light could also have been qualified as a city of sounds. This presentation seeks to develop some ideas about sound from a multidisciplinary perspective that merges cultural history, sound studies, and literary criticism. The main idea here is to describe the 19th century soundscape in parallel with written expressions in literature of its psychological, physiological, and political effects. I will argue that a focus on sound as an acoustic wave allows us to understand how a sonorous narrative can touch the reader's imaginary. Whether it is one's own voice as one speaks out, an internal dialogue, mental reading of a text, or sounds heard from external sources, co-vibrations cool of acoustic events resonate through the listener, listener's body. To better understand how a sonorous narrative can touch the reader's imaginary, it is helpful to recall basic concepts of acoustic engineering and psychoacoustics. When uh, transmitted as neural impulses, an acoustic wave is measured primarily in terms of frequency and amplitude. To simplify the matter, let's say that amplitude could be said as corresponding to sound level or how loud a sound may be. Interestingly, sound level and the perception of loudness do not quite correspond to one another. For indeed, research in psychoacoustics have shown that loudness is dependent on the ear sensitivity, which may vary from one listener to another. This is not to suggest that perception of loudness is altogether subjective because it is dependent on the ear's sensitivity. As Michel Chion explains, perception is not a purely individual phenomenon since it partakes in a particular kind of objectivity, that of shared perceptions. The table that follows, presents a variety of shared perceptions felt by most listeners when they hear specific sounds commonly heard in urban and pastoral acoustic environments. In the table, the, uh, these perception corresponds to the category and listed um, this one, I hope you can see my cursor, um, average perceived loudness. So I think as you can see, um, Sound level and perception of loudness do not exactly correspond to one another. In fact, the more the amplitude increases, the greater sound, the perception of loudness is multiplied. A second conclusion we can draw is that damage to the ear begins to decrease at 130 decibels, but it remains a source of annoyance for, from that level on the way. So of course, this is danger level, but then it's, it, it continues to be kind of damage to the ear uh, all the way to the 60 decibel, which is intrusive. Uh, the third conclusion derived from the previous one, looking at amplitudes compromised uh, within this range, uh, 130 to 60 decibels, we can easily see that the listed sounds are present in most people's daily life. Busy street, um, city street, noisy restaurants, light car traffic, and even normal conversation. This is not all. Sound waves vibrations create co-vibrations that resonate in the body as a whole. Michel Chion describes the difference between sound as an acoustic wave and sound as a co-vibration resonating in the body. One is measurable in mathematical terms and the other not. 
One belongs to physics and the other one to the realm of the senses. This distinction is important, I think, for the term sound is commonly used to denote a variety of acoustic and non-acoustic phenomena, which, although they happen simultaneously, are far from being of the same nature, having the same properties and functions, like a cold sound doesn't correspond to vibration or frequency or amplitude, pitch and treble to a warm sound, etc. Similarly, in his discussion on sound and vision, sound theorist Douglas Kahn emphasizes that, and I quote, a sound of adequate, adequate intensity can be felt on and within the body as a whole, thereby dislocating the frontal and conceptual associations of vision within all around corporality and spatiality. In other words, end quote, in other words, while visual events can produce chills, goosebumps, adrenaline rushes, flutters, startles, and all sorts of physiological and psychological reactions, so can acoustic events. In fact, Ken notes that sound may be considered more forceful and intrusive than vision because acoustic waves penetrate the listener's ear regardless the location of the onset, whether front, side, back, up, down, whereas light waves are limited by the human field of vision altogether frontal. Now, coming back to the Parisian soundscape of the, 19, of the mid 19th century, we know that in urban, more than rural settings, the process of industrialization introduced a wide variety of sounds that mixed with those heard long before it began. And in an area as greatly transformed as, by mechanization as pa the Paris basin was, both on land and water, sonic congestion grew rapidly. The development of industry and metallurgy, urban migration and construction work not only generated an entire variety of new sounds, human and mechanical, but also sound wave amplitude was higher and more uniformly transmitted throughout the city than it had been in previous centuries. It is hardly surprising then that the, the amplitude of sounds newly arrived was at times so great that it would muffle, smother, and even cover that of older sounds to such an extent that these new sounds seemed to fill entirely certain areas of the soundscape in which people were immersed. When it comes to the French capital, the process of industrialization does not carry the sole responsibility for the new sonic congestion. Indeed, we should also take into account demolition work from the restoration started in 1814 to 1830 to the Second Empire, 1852 to 1860, or 70, sorry, and more specifically, Baron Haussmann's unprecedented transformation of the French capital. So Haussmann's work lasted for 17 years, for 17 years of demolition, construction, and a whole bunch of intense disruptions, both uh, visual and sonic, from 1853 to 1870 a period of time during which Paris was the greatest building site in the world with uh, thousands of people working seven days a week. Some of them worked all day and all hours, 24 hours sometimes. Often the work would continue through the night uninterrupted until the next morning. No doubt then, the new broad streets, large avenues, luxurious parks and gardens, among, along with installation of gas lights, significantly widened people's visual field. Parisians could see better and farther than ever before. At the same time, however, with the disappearance of barriers, the city soundscape became more uniform, the sound waves being transmitted and areas they covered were respectively greater and wider than ever before. 19th century industrial culture thus created a twofold phenomenon. Increased visibility came with a more uniform soundscape of increased loudness. Compared to the glitter of the street plants, brightness of new avenues, openness of new parks, Increased loudness received little attention. 
this imbalance, I think, delayed the prise de conscience, the coming to consciousness of the negative effects of loudness and explains in part why all those studies in the 1830s and 1890 had uh, established a link between sound levels and damage to the ear, we have to wait until 1970 for any serious regulations uh, to be implemented. As uh, Robert Murray Schaffer notes, and I quote, the term boiler maker disease came into use shortly after Dr. S Dr. Thomas Barr's study on loss of hearing in uh, Glasgow boiler makers, which happened. That study was made in 87, 80, 1886 uh, to refer to all kinds of industrial uh, hearing loss though uh, its prevention only received serious consideration in most industrialized countries towards 1970, end quote. It is as if city dwellers were led to believe that industrial sounds had become a natural state of things in their acoustic environment. The mechanized sound had become the natural sounds. In the meantime, mechanical and human loudness penetrated people's bodies and minds uncensored. The study of the reasons why the 19th century uh, coming to consciousness of the negative effects of loudness was rather slow to come to being manifest an inner dysfunction. Increased loudness has as a corollary, uncensored authority, or better still, imperialism by way of sound. Whoever controls loudness gains power over the sonar space it covers, and the need to control as much of the sensorial landscape as possible, as possible is a means to exercise power. It is important to note that visual imaginary can yield to audio imaginary. This sensorial shift between sight and hearing may be analyzed in terms of a narrative that conveys sonorous images as much as, and at times even more, than visual images. To illustrate this idea, let me turn to Baudelaire, the poet of the crowd, as uh, Walter Benjamin um, calls him. Uh, and I think I have the quote here. Yes, it's a poem that is called A une passante, to a passerby. And uh, I'll Read it in French because I think it's it's important. Uh, it, it, the language and the the assonances and everything of the friend, the way that it's written, um, partakes into that uh, experience of a sonorous narrative. La rue assourdissante autour de moi hurlait, longue, mince, en grand deuil, douleur majestueuse, une femme passa, d'une main fastueuse sous le vent, balançant le feston et l'ourlet. The translation is here, and that's my translation. I try to be as, um, you know, not as poetic, but more closer to the text. The deafening street around me roared, tall, slender, in deep mourning, majestic pain. A woman passed by with a dignified hand, raising the flounces and hem of her gown. Um, so the antagonism between uh, the first verse and the rest of the stanza, the stanza uh, can be said to illustrate a tension between hearing and seeing. What makes the woman's figure so mesmerizing is that she stands out as an erotic and phantasmagoric representation in the midst of tangible noise. Moreover, she, uh, that she would be in deep mourning adds to the antagonistic juxtaposition of oral and visual. For indeed, mourning is attached to death, usually associated with silence. In the poem, silence in death mixes with deafening noise, that is loss of hearing. This is the place where a phantasmagoric anguish is manifested in the corporality and spirituality of the stroller. In Baudelaire's poem, the writing of sound conveys, conveys the conflicting idea of intimacy in the anonymity of a large city crowd on the one hand, and on the other, deadly silence of forlornness in the midst of chaotic noise. 
It is as if the idealized representation of the passerby enables the writer to escape in poetic death from the reality of the industrial culture. The other example I have, and that's the that's with this example I will end this uh, presentation I chose is a passage of uh, Emile Zola's Au Bonheur des Dames, The Ladies' Paradise, first published in 1883. Uh, with this novel, we are uh, in the heart of Osman's uh, transformations. Paris is torn to pieces. Uh, split into sections, deconstructed, and with this con deconstruction corresponds to the creation of a new type of commerce symbolized by the department store, the ladies paradise, which feeds on the old commerce, the small boutiques and shop of the pre-industrial era that are disappearing. Napoleon III, the emperor at that time, uses his political machine and reconstructs Paris out of the ashes for which he himself is responsible. Here is the narrator's description of the city's reconstruction. And again, I will read it in French, but you have the translation in English. Cependant, tout le quartier causé de la grande voie qu'on allait ouvrir, du nouvel opéra à la bourse, sous le nom de rue du 10 décembre. Les juges d'expropriation étaient rendus, les jugements d'expropriation étaient rendus, deux bandes de démolisseurs attaquaient déjà la trouée aux deux bouts, l'une abattant les vieux hôtels de la rue Louis-le-Grand, l'autre renversant les murs légers de l'ancien vaudeville. Et l'on entendait des, les pioches qui se rapprochaient. La rue de Choiseul et la rue de la Michaudière se passionnaient pour leurs maisons condamnées. Avant 15 jours, la trouée devait les éventrer d'une large entaille pleine de vacarme et de soleil. So I read just the end, the few last uh, lines, of, uh, the last sentence actually, before a fortnight was out, the breach would make a great gash through them, full of noise and sunshine. Uh, so I can stop sharing here. Um, so is it a reconstruction, a construction or a deconstruction? All three seem kind of in, um, indistinguishable. Uh, the new boulevards are born of the demolition of the old streets and buildings. Uh, they are born of Napoleon III's coming to power as the great thoroughfare will be named the 10 décembre, 10th of December, in commemoration of his being elected president of the Republic by 74% of the votes uh, in 1848. The French word trouée, a, a breach, refers to a large and long canal dug in the ground. It requires heavy machinery and manpower, which no doubt make quite a lot of noise. Interestingly, Zoé, uh, Zola uses the word trouée twice, thus reiterating the idea of the abyss into which the old com commerce is about to fall. Under the noise of pickaxes heard closer and closer in the ears of those whose houses and shops are about to be destroyed, the reader can hear the pre-industrial era coming closer to its end. Finally, the resonating alliteration throughout the passage give the narrative its harsh, crisp, and sarcastic tone. The deafening street around me roared. Uh, sorry. Um, and in the last sentence, Uh, avant 15 jours, la trouée devait les éventrer d'une large entraille pleine de vacarme et de soleil. The balancing of assonances and alliterations is a balances of euphony and cacophony, human and mechanical. In the end, it reveals the tension between a more democratic social structure and a more authoritarian imperialistic social structure. Thank you, I'm done. Thank you, Alix. Uh, thank you to all three of you. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, so perhaps we'll open it up to discussion and questions. And um, if anyone wants to jump in, it was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, thank you, beautiful. I, I agree. I think there's a, I mean, uh, for, um, 
a small panel like this. It was very uh, versatile, but there are some relationships between the three um, the three presentations. And I have questions for both of you. Um, uh, so Pella and Ning, because um, you talk a little bit, Pella more than Ning, but uh, of co-vibration. And I was wondering if you ever thought of maybe a connection between uh, those vibration, co-vibrations and, um, and the sounds and phenomenology, because it looks for the both of you and for me as well, the part that the body carries, the body in the city is very important. We could not have any of the experiences that you have been talking about without the physical presence and really the body within the sound. Um, so I was wondering if you ever thought of some kind of uh, phenomenologic experience of the soundscape. Yeah, and I, you mentioned, I think you mentioned Don Ely in your presentation. Did you? I Tell thought me. Do, the, the Don Ely, the, the, the voice phenomenologist, I thought, or no, what maybe it was Ponty. I think maybe you mentioned Ponty. Oh. I didn't, I didn't I didn't I didn't I didn't mention Merleau Ponty but I was thinking about him for both who, Ning who and, and you who was it that you cited talking about how sound hits us from oh, all around uh Douglas Can who is Douglas a, Can a, um, Australian can, uh yeah can you put can you like send put the citation or something sure, in the, the chat because that would be super yeah. useful yeah, uh, yeah, I'm sorry about that. So Douglas Ken, I believe yeah. he's the, uh, and uh, he's, um, he's uh, the book I'm citing is called Noise, Water, and Meat. I, I would have to, uh, I don't have my notes here, but uh, pretty sure it's Noise, Water, and Meat. Um, but I'll, I'll look at the reference again else and just to verify right now. Yeah. I'm, I'm always up for some good phenomenology. Um, I don't know that I would necessarily call this phenomenology, but it speaks to what you were talking, um, is that are, there appears to be a slide missing from my presentation where I was talking sort of about, about like Sarah Florini talking about how digital, like how sonic enclaves can create a sense of co-presence community um, with, in terms of like black podcasts uh, and black people listening to um, black podcasts in public space but also um, with Haygood, who writes a lot about how, how headphones are sort of like the ultimate libertarian erasure of bodies from public. Um, and, and so thinking about how we experience the world through that. Um, but that actually brings me to a, uh, I don't know, you, you had, said you had a question for Ning, but it makes me think of something I was thinking about Ning with yours. I keep going back to that moment where you're talking about the clicking on and off of a light and that the sound is there, but you, you don't see the light turning on. And, and thinking about, um, I think I was reading a book, I think it was Marie Schnell. Yeah, it was Marie Schnell's book on lip syncing where she actually does a phenomenology of the process of, of assimilating a unknown sound into our knowledge of like when you hear a bird sound and you look for the bird and you adjust it our brain naturally wants to resolve the, den the tension because it's trained to associate sound and image. So I was curious of like how, like what textual context, this idea of like the acousmatic sound there of it being, being something in, and your description said that they just had to learn to live with it. Yeah. Um... For me, I wasn't really thinking about phenom phenomenology. I was more thinking about um, the interface between affect and media, which is theorized by Marshall McLuhan. And I think this is how um, in Anna Burns' book, man, these kind of digital noises, the clicking and also kind of uh, telephone ringing and uh, television broadcasting and as well as radio, which I didn't really mention because of the time. I think they all, all these kind of noises have kind of bodily trans transmission to the urban body itself. And I think it creates um, a very interesting, I think also resonate with Bo's presentation as the idea of, of imbalance, where in the novel, there's a lot of um, how this kind of noises create um, imbalance of the body, like where legs cannot working and also 
um, dancing but falling from uh, falling to the floor. And I think these are kind of very interesting idea of how um, we have to live with the noises itself and how noises impact our everyday life. So what I have in mind is, um, I apologize for my pronunciation, but uh, Michelle Seher's um, concept of noise in the communication. Yeah, so I think this is kind of the communication between the urban body and the landscape itself of how we cannot ignore the, now, the noise and we have to uh, kind of acknowledge its, its uh, presence and we have to live with the everyday imbalance of our lives. Yeah, so I think this is what's in my mind. But you mentioned noise there and like yeah. what constitutes noise and what constitutes yeah. a key sound right, is, right. is very political there. I think you would, yeah. you the book Hush by Mac Haygood, I think you would like really enjoy because right. it's a lot of a lot of looking at like the role of sound of noise and also like the erasure of sound a lot of it's about tinnitus as well and and how the marketing of like Bose headphones was essentially um to erase the sounds of children and shrill women women on airplanes so mm -hmm. it I think I think within that like the noise what we what like I, I i think this is what sort of what i liked about alex about your presentation as well is that um like shafe or shion is bringing like quantitative a more quantitative yeah, approach yeah, to, so that to give us a, a a less polemic um or less um suspect definition of noise than we might get um in other yeah. No, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, that, now it's done. <laughs> uh, I think also, and with your presentations, I, I really enjoyed also the fact that you are bringing this, the, quant the qualitative in a way, um, uh, uh, aspect or uh, research on sound and acoustics uh, because it's been for the long time and I think that's why it's important that we do that because for the longest time you know it's only people who are sound engineers or specialized in acoustics that should speak about sound and and you know no not just you because we have our own experience as readers and I um, when uh, Nin uh, uh, when you 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 quoted Burns on page fifty nine, I think, and when on that uh, about the click, the click thing, and I was reading it, and I could hear just by the words the repetition, yeah. the like, motif yeah. of that click, click, click. I yeah. could really so I had that kind of sonorous experience. It's right. almost like a you know it's a sound writing in some ways. So it goes. I think it's uh it, it's very interesting in that sense, both of your presentation that uh, it's not just uh, sound as you know, we can describe a sound, but it's also how writing can transmit the sound itself. And the dance was also fabulous. It, I don't know, I felt like I really wanted to see it. It sounds amazing. But what I was wondering about um, you, uh, Bella, is uh, when you, you know, you talk about imbalance, turbulence, and then disorderly disturbance. And I was thinking also difference because all this kind of builds because you were creating, you were saying it creates something different. So I was wondering, what do you think about disorder as a different space? And I think that's what also the piece from Anna Burns might do as well. So it's not just that it's, an imbalance, but it's kind of a different kind of balance that they're bringing at the same time, you know? Right. Early drafts of this paper, I'm I'm prepping this to send this out to journals right now. Um, and um, an early version of this focused much more in on the language of imbalance, because that's the language that Dickinson is using sort of within his piece to sort of text bank. And, it, and the fact that he is alluding to that in his piece at the same time that the dance very much is that he is evoking a lot of imbalance with his choreography as well. Um, but I think I think you're correct. Difference is a better way of looking at it. And I, you also sort of just made me think of like um, Derrida's sort of idea of difference and the idea that the the people 
that are foregrounded here as us having empathy are the ones that had always, who are coded within the space as the other, as the intruder mm -hmm. into the space, where in a weird way, through like his dialogic performance by embodying um, these, uh, these, and his embodiment, I wouldn't say is like a literal dialogic performance, it's much more affectual, but he's, he's, he's turning it in, he's, it, rather than being the people that are, are, the spectators who are used to being the people who are using the space correctly, are invited into a world where they are the outsider, where they, and they are, are let into this, um, into this shared headspace through the, the soundscape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, sorry, Ming, I don't know if you wanted to add something. I have another question for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, you were talking about the, the post agreement of peace, I remember, and uh, you made the distinction between a uh, control society and disciplinary society. Yes. Um, and that, that's, I think that's, that's great that you make that distinction. What I wasn't sure is I can understand very well disciplinary society as I, as I would, but that's just my interpretation, more like in a Foucault sense of um, discipline and punish. Uh, but the control society, I wasn't completely sure I understood that concept. So if you wouldn't mind um, maybe describing it a little more for us. Yeah, um, so I think it's also about space, um, which Pella and um, Professor, you mentioned in your presentation is that um, in disciplinary societies is that um, they control, uh, they, they kind of um, use, adopt this kind of adopt um, in closed spaces where they enclose individuals like prisons and yeah. hospitals, uh, asylum, but in a control society, we no, uh, no longer need those kind of enclosed spaces because um, the boundary is always there. It's always fluid and we're always sort of enclosed in all different kind of ways. So um, this create a kind of temporal logic that we are um, never, and we are endlessly um, being enclosed. So there's no need to kind of demarcate the boundary mm -hmm. of the spaces here. I so, you, yeah, so I think in, in, a, in the case of Anna Burns Milkman, um, um, I think it's also important that um, she often brought about the mental illness of living in uh, the troubles. And I think what's also what resonated was the other presentation is that um, um, they are living in kind of like not an asylum anymore but the whole country is a kind of asylum where they all of them are mentally ill and I think this also creates this kind of schizophrenia that Pella also mentioned in her presentation as well so yes yeah <laughs> yeah 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 I understand better now yeah it's very spatial in some ways or the space is understood or lived differently. Um, right. Yeah, so yeah, that's great. Um, I actually have a question as well um, for um, Alex. Um, I'm really interested about what you mentioned in the end of your presentation about the human and machine interaction. Yeah, and also about the uh, the power dynamics of who controls sound, who controls the loudness. And you mentioned the imperial history. And I'm just wondering, um, how do you read this power dynamics with the human and machine um, uh, distinction in the 19th century French history? Well, that's kind of the idea. Yeah, thank you for the question. It's, um, that's the thing, it's a little bit like what you're saying. We, they don't even need to have a distinction. There's no distinction anymore between, and I was talking about human um, sounds, human you know, uh, sounds and mechanical sounds, not the humans and, me and mechanic machinery itself, but, uh, but sounds of them, the sound they produce. Uh, and those become kind of indistinguishable. Um, uh, so they kind of mixed with each other. Uh, sort of like a Haraway cyborg. 
yeah, yeah exactly yeah. and that that's that's amazing because you know uh, and in, in both present in your pr two presentation as well i was thinking oh my god you know we're still there you know in 2021 even even more maybe and i was thinking uh, uh, ning i was thinking oh my god if uh, you know anna burns she wrote this uh, i forgot but anyway it almost looks like she was a visionary as as you know, she was talking about digital sounds already. That's amazing. Uh, but uh, to go back to the human and mechanical sounds, yes, it is almost like the way that the the the, the sounds of power, because it's really kind of that, um, uh, uh, invade and covers the whole soundscape, uh, pretty much, is almost like a sonorous palimpsest meaning that uh, they, they kind of merge and, and by merging with the human and the older sounds uh, of the pre-industrial era, pre-capitalistic era, um, uh, are still there, but they are very muffled and it's almost like the new sounds cover them like a palimpsest. So you don't see the older, you don't hear the older sound, not as much um because you have the new sound and it's a whole new soundscape that is made of that palimpsest of the older covered by the new and um and in a way that's uh that's you know a little bit frightening but at the same time it's okay if you if you know that's why i was talking about the prise de conscience uh, uh, you know uh, consciousness like the the coming into consciousness of this phenomenon if if people know about it then uh then they lose control i mean the, the they regain power in a way yeah. and and i think that's very very important that people understand that this is not you know the the sounds we have now are not natural sounds you know right, it's like right. oh, they're not natural sounds they are mechanical so man-made and they are made for a specific purpose as well to gear you towards something and um and so the work of anna burns and the work of the choreographer dickinson and mm -hmm. and Paul watch those are the kind of works that you know tell us okay look this is or here you know this is not uh, natural mm -hmm. i have a, a colleague at i believe simon fraser i don't I remember if she's at ryerson or simon fraser named lauren knight and she's just doing a lot of indigenous sound studies which is which is really growing within sound studies in canada right now and she's writing about the use of headphones as decolonialist resistance and sort of survivance and I found that fascinating because a lot of, you know, um, an indigenous theory um, goes into the idea of storytelling as creating presence. But I, I think it's fascinating to think about the fact that like, like to, to, to create presence, you have to erase the, um, the, the technologies that were layered on top of it. Um, like in thinking of like, um, when R. Murray Schaefer talks about like the, the sounds of like the farm and <laughs> and stuff yeah, that yeah. the 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 notion of the soundscape there is something almost like that there's a certain level of ontological and yet the presence of the farm itself and the barn shapes that sound so like we will never get back to a place where where a soundscape is like a purely like ontological and not touched by human thing and mm -hmm. unless there's a mass extinction extinction event um and then we won't be here to um we won't be here to hear it and which from a phenomenological um perspective means it doesn't exist to me so mm -hmm. yeah um, adding on that i have a question for um uh, pella is that um i'm just uh, a very simple question is that um if we're using headphones in the performance of astro dickinson and we're shutting off the street noise so why is we, you know, not incorporating the noise around the street noise while we are wearing headphones? Is that, and I think street noise is also very important. So the opening, the opening um, track that Paul Walsh did, the very opening track begins with um, street noise. Okay. Um, it begins with street noise and you're, it's, you're slowly being, and that makes the interpolation, I think, a lot easier. So okay. he's at the beginning, he's replacing what you would normally hear with what you would normally hear. It's just 
the source of it is being controlled because one of the things about the urban soundscape um, is that it's going um, sort of to talk about some of the stuff you're talking about in your piece is that you don't control this the urban soundscape the urban soundscape controls you but there's a certain performativity to being listening to a soundscape that you voluntarily put headphones on to hear um which is something that i that like michael bull talks a lot about with um with i with ipod culture and um one of the things that sound bubble and and particularly sarah florini in her book beyond hashtags talks about as well okay thanks but i would imagine i'm not sure what's trying to picture it if i have my headphones listening to um uh, to paul walsh a uh, sound uh, sound creation is there music or is there sound all the time because if there isn't if there are moments of silence then i will hear right. i guess huh? the, the, right. the exterior sounds in some ways which is fine i think that's great because it kind of mixes but yeah Again, I was not there. I listened with my headphones, so I can only speak to what I can by the experience with my headphones. But the way that noise canceling headphones are work is that they replace the sound with white noise. So even mm -hmm. when there's nothing going through a soundscape, the um, noise canceling headphones are actually generating sound. So mm -hmm. you're so what they're doing is that they're measuring the frequencies coming in and they're replacing those frequencies with white noise um, in addition to that. So um, there are moments of it where, where it gets much quieter, but because depending on how good your headphones are, my assumption is you would not be able to hear anything. You would not, there would not be substantial bleeding of sound in, um, particularly because some of the critics have talked about like what a, what a powerful experience it was when they finally took the headphones off at the end of the piece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, yeah. Oh, that's very interesting. And I haven't read uh, the Anna Burns uh, Milkman, but now I feel like I, yeah, I, I want to as well. <laughs> yes. So. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I was thinking about the can the noise canceling headphones. I don't know if you've ever tried to walk with them. If if you do like power walking, I guess one of the elements that came across to me from all of your uh, presentations was this idea of sub subjectivity, and the canceling um, noise canceling headphones for me make me aware of a sort of an imbalance. Uh, where I can hear my heartbeat and I cannot walk and listen to something with those on. I have to have regular, you know, earbuds or something like that. They just literally cause an imbalance. So I'm thinking, how does that work with the video of the performance? I'm going to have to go and watch the video and see that level of, of subjectivity that comes from that white noise. Right. But there's another layer that is not there, which is the what the person wearing the noise canceling headphones actually feels if they right. move. Right. And that's why I tried to include as much eyewitness critical reviews um, to, to get a sense of what the people there were experiencing. Um, yeah. And I've also actually I've I've talked to Dickinson a, a couple of times and what he was experiencing was much more different. But what I think I from listening to everyone or reading everybody's sort of responses to that piece and listening to Dickinson talk about it, the subjectivity felt much more effectual and bringing in memory for a piece mm -hmm. for him that includes like such personal things. And, and there's also like a phenomenology of the space is that these are spaces that he was intimately familiar with that he chose because he had a um, relationship with previously existing relationship with those spaces. So mm -hmm. I don't necessarily think that it's possible to separate one subjectivity from the other. Um, I personally don't like wearing noise canceling headphones, um, mm -hmm. and which makes me in, in podcast studies makes me a real stick <laughs> in the mud. Um, <laughs> like I listen to, I listen and edit to everything off of the speakers in my, um, on my laptop because I am more listening to for content than than just the effectual and I think that we can have 
an effectual relationship with the content. And mm -hmm. I am so often overwhelmed and like noise canceling headphones, unless you get the volume right, can also really mess up your ears. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. like I like I I think I would have enjoyed to be wearing the noise head canceling and and I will add this. I the first time I watched this, I was on my lunch hour working in a wood shop um, with my headphones on. So my previous sound experience, I'd been going from very, 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 very loud sounds to much more intimate sounds. And I definitely think that that played an effect in how overwhelming the experience was as I was as I was watching it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's super interesting because it adds another dimension. But I, I noticed that same subjectivity in in the uh, Milkman novel where you have I think it was middle sister that's very disturbed by the clicking noises and her brother in law is I, not uh, at all. He just yeah. ignores them. So you have that. And also in um, in the Zola piece, absolutely, where you have the people and their conversation is being silenced by the construction noise. So that also you have that that same dimension, which is interesting. Yeah, and like so what I think much in common. with with the novel, Ning, one of the things I think so interesting is that you're you're describing sounds that are really not describing sounds, you're describing meta sounds, sounds mm -hmm. that only exist in the imagination mm -hmm. of the listener. So that mm -hmm. is like a level of subjectivity that it's like like almost a uh I, I was gonna say like um negative sound object um because it's got the because the feeling is explicit and the source is explicit but the sound is does not exist and, right. and so like the idea of like a meta sound and how we talk about the discourse with that being, I'm curious about how much visual language is used to describe sound in that book, because one of the things I found writing about sound is how hard it is to come up with different words for sounds that aren't visual. Um, I think Burns' um, novel can could be read as um, a sort of cacophony, because there's a lot of, um, how do I put it? Um, um, like the sound of the sound, like um, click or- Onomatopoeia. <laughs> yeah, right. There's a lot of that going on in the novel. So I guess that also added kind of sonorous experience in that. And um, I think, um, yeah, um, let me check my- So I guess it's how, um, I think for Burns is not really how you visualize the sound, it's that you are immersed in those sound that does not describe the unmentionable sounds that you can fill in the novel of the narrative instead of like how um, um, the description of the sound itself. So yeah, so, so I think that's a similar link to the idea of control that the whole novel is framed in. It's those kind of unmentionable sounds that you can sense in the narrative. So maybe it is a little bit closer to Pierre Schaeffer's notion of sound objects. Yeah, I guess, right? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for pointing out. I think subjectivity is definitely something very important in the novel as well. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I, uh, I completely agree. I think it's more like more than vi trying to visualize a sound because again we go back to that you know dichotomy vision and 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 right. sound but uh, m more than trying to visualize a sound i think you really have to experience it or to live it or like maria was saying in a way it's like the subjectivity of that sound so as you read uh you know you read mentally most of the time uh, but you know those sounds are there so um it's based on memory sorry what it, it's it's somehow triggers different memories of sounds which is interesting Pella was talking yeah. about the fact that the piece the the performance was actually bringing the dimension of personal memories and link to the space where it was performed 
So you have that same thing when you read something, it's your memory of the sound because you're not recreating it in. Yeah, and you, do, you don't, especially, I think, because I think it, it's still very much, uh, especially with sound, I think it's very much at the level of more subconscious or some other, the other self. Um, uh, it's not really the, the, the rational, you know, Cartesian rational or Kantian kind of self. It, it's more, yeah, the, 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 uh, the inner self in many ways. Uh, and um and it's really interesting to have a dancer, you know, speak the language of sounds and the language of words with the body and with a musical score. So basically telling us a text, a musical text. And then on the other hand, we have Ning and Anna Barnes, who is almost doing some kind of sound writing with onomatopoeia and things like that. And uh, so it's almost like a different approach of reading a text. Um, and, and I think that's really fascinating. Uh, it feels very, very interesting. It opens up, I think, it really opens up the, the creativity in writing or thinking about reading and about the text. Um, it's, uh, yeah, so we'll see, you know. <laughs> you two should write a novel maybe <laughs> that would be interesting <laughs> well well all of you you should publish your papers because they were wonderful and i discovered uh interesting things i i discovered videos and books that i want to read so it's it's wonderful okay thank you thank you maria thank for you so much for this, this opportunity so i really 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 enjoyed this this was this yeah. was so much fun Wonderful. I'm glad we had it. And again, thank you so much. It was a very, very good presentation and a panel. Um, I wish we could speak more, but we're running out of time, really. So, okay. Yeah, next question start in eight minutes. <laughs> I just got an email that I have my groceries just arrived, so I'm going to have to go get those. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I will. I will I will save the chat and um, send the link for the recording. So thank you, so thank you everyone. It was really a pleasure. Really yes. a pleasure meeting all of you. Me Good too. luck with your research, everyone. Okay. Yep. Bye. Take care. Bye bye.